three members of the panel or the panel as a whole, and the panel, of course, reserves the right to make uh, comments on each other's comments. Yes. So I'd like to uh, raise a topic for whatever uh, I guess the question. Um, you referred to the uh, crowding out of private science by uh, the government of this industry. Um, but I think, uh, from my point of view, we use much stronger words than crowding out in that uh, many aspects of government science are really self-referencing uh, industries, starting taxing over the pay of money for promotion of their points in the political life. Uh, mm -hmm. In, in aggregate, or fundamentally committing uh, scientific fraud, the global warming industry is uh, Exhibit A. Uh, last year, we had an amazing presentation of Peter Duesberg suggesting that the HIV uh, research industry was another of those exhibits. Um, you can also take the point of view that there's a massive income misallocation of resources uh, based on what's politically prop, uh, popular, uh, the whole space program in America is, uh, from a scientific point of view, wasted a vast amount of money versus the other alternatives for space research. And I suspect that the cancer research industry uh, is a self-referencing, largely misdirected research field where tens of billions of dollars are being spent. So this is broad and mis massive misallocation of resources. I'd like you to comment on that. Okay, well, I mean, you could add eugenics to that. Early half of this century, all scientists said that eugenics was really important. We had to go around sterilizing the mentally affected. It was all based on false understanding of Professor genes, which came on YouTube thoughts. Yes, the thing about scientists is that it's a mistake to believe scientists believe in falsification. Scientists are advocates, they have points of view they're trying to foster, and competitors disagree with them. But scientists have to ignore falsification because when you're at the forefront of knowledge, lots of facts come along that you don't understand. And if you accepted them as having falsified what you were doing, you wouldn't proceed. I couldn't talk at length, of it, but, you know, but, but let me just say that scientists have to ignore inconvenient data if they're going to do what they want to do, because ultimately inconvenient data can be explained away if you're right. And if the incentives are wrong, and they are in science, if governments fund science without any measurable outcome, just in the assumption that somehow it will translate to economic growth 10 years down the line, so they can never be held to account, then scientists will indeed take as much money as they can to produce their own papers, to refer to each other nicely, to give each other prizes, with no external references, science is potentially a very corrupt activity actually. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going for Professor Van Dom. Uh, Frank, I enjoyed your, your talk and uh, gave you shared with us excellent observations and about uh, the nature of conflicts and gave us a definition of crime and so on. But to me, it sounded a bit like foreplay, and uh, it seemed that you stopped just at the moment when the action became exciting. That is, what is the punishment that would fit the crime, and would you sort of uh, uh, lean towards Rothbard and Lex Talionis and double Lex Talionis, or Randy Barnett and pure execution and, and, and so on? This is what I, I would have liked reading the title of your talk with this is what I'd like, like to hear. Now, it's unfair to ask you to do a conference that you, you talk that you didn't uh, give, but could you, you know, give us rapidly whether you are on one side or the other of this debate or maybe in between? Okay, uh, of course the uh, occasion was limited to 30 minutes and the uh, the idea, I, I dislike the, the idea to rush through to a conclusion uh, that is not uh, evident 
from what has been said before. Right? So I just laid out the, the groundwork for the, uh, the arguments, and hopefully uh, those of you who are interested will develop from there and go uh, find the conclusion. Now, as to, as to your specific questions, whether I am on this side or another side, I, I think I can claim to be a side of my own, so uh, I do not have to choose between two set camps. As I said, punishment to me is a, a compounded negative, so there is no justification at all for uh, punishment, uh, although there could be, there can be reasons for it, because let like say it is a good policy uh, of uh, deterrence, or it is a good method for teaching kids uh, discipline and so on. But as a response uh, to crime, the only proper uh, response to crime is uh, restitution. And when restitution falls short, when there is no full restitution, and that means full, not just uh, the, the, the harm done uh, when the deed was done, but also the, the consequences as well. But when full restitution and compensation falls short, and there is no repentance on the part of the, uh, the tort feeder or the criminal to make whole amends, or to make things whole again, then I think the threat of uh, punishment uh, and, and the punishment, the infliction of punishment uh, becomes uh, justified. But it is justified in the same way and for the same reason. I'm talking as a philosopher, so it probably doesn't make sense to uh, anybody else, but it, it is justifiable for the same reason that you have to use force and uh, harsh measures to teach the beast. Right? Mm. If someone uh, cuts out of the process of doing justice and maintaining justice, uh, so he refuses to go into the argument, then of course, when reason fails, you can only use force. Right? And now for some, in some cases, that moment they we uh, come very rapidly, and in other moments that, uh, in other cases, that moment may be very remote, uh, so there is no particular thing. As to the harshness of the punishment, uh, I think the punishment, first of all, uh, the right of inflicting the punishment is with the, vi the victim. Right? But one has also have to consider that maybe uh, the the criminal or the court feeder or whatever uh, you want to call him uh, has obligations against other persons who are innocent of the crime. And in inflicting punishment, I, I think that the basic uh, limit or the uh, essential limit is that you do not, by your punishment, inflict uh, harm or uh, damage or uh, invade or harm or diminish the rights of other innocent uh, persons that I think. For the rest, as I said, most crimes happen in contexts which are much more richer uh, in uh, content than the pure Rothbardian or Randy uh, Barnettian or whatever uh, <laughs> context. Uh, so the, the ideas people have of what is effective and what is proper will of necessity be determined in the peculiar context. And they will not be influenced in any way by whatever may be said in a place such as this. A question from Professor Hotte. Uh, the flow of money we can say is quite complicated. Can really be figured out which taxes pay for the construction of streets. Thus, put to the extreme, uh, your proposition might suggest that uh, everyone who buys true income because pays the sales tax, acquires a microscopic title to every street, street within the respective nation state, and thus acquires the right uh, to free entry to make it very cheap. So, I wonder where would you set the limit? and uh, uh, which role would residency play uh, compared to uh, the amount of money that you pay in taxes? Um, to some extent, I uh, can continue 
what uh, Vice Van Nant said. Um, I don't think it is too wise to um, to try to be too precise in all of these matters. Um, my friend Walter Block tends to be on the side that he thinks that you can ha hammer out a priori solution to any yeah. type of legal complication that arises. Um, my purpose was only to indicate the principles that are involved in all of this, to recognize that there can be such things as easements um, or no easements in the case of streets, you typically do have uh, easements. In, in all concrete situations, I think this I would leave up to um, the profession of lawyers. Uh, the profession of lawyers is of course currently in a status environment blown up uh, to huge proportions, uh, but lawyers uh, judges, arbitrators, and so forth will play a great role in any type, any type of society. So all detailed uh, decisions uh, I would leave up to, um, yeah, uh, to boards of experts who would decide how to apply these principles that I laid down. I did not want to do more than just, yeah make obvious what major principles are involved. The application of principles is sometimes a tricky, difficult field. I try to abstain from things like this unless I have a concrete situation in front of me and then um, I will consult with people um, and I believe that um, a reasonable application of the principles can be found to the case in the same way as Frank basically emphasized too, um, there can be cultural context that make a certain crime be judged in this way, uh, in this place, and the same type of deed uh, would be treated slightly differently or somewhat differently in a different cultural, uh, cultural context. Um. Can I just say something a little bit about restitution? I mean, I have experienced a fair number of criminals, admittedly they're British criminals. Um, uh, but what I would say with restitution is I wish you luck with that. <laughs> because uh, I don't think the administration of uh, restitution will be very easy. So I do not rule out uh, punishment. As I said, sometimes the moment of punishment is, is very close, and sometimes it is very remote. But uh, I, I was not addressing specific cases, and uh, there are uh, uh, cases of uh, fraud, for example, and theft, which are not uh, committed by the, the underclass in which you specialize. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Sometimes uh, restitution is indeed uh, advised, I would say. Yeah. In the case of Mr. Madoff, I think he needs a, a sentence of longer than 150 years in his case of restitution. Uh, I think, uh, it's, in fact, restitution, while I'm not against restitution, of course, the fact is that it's, uh, it, it will play a very, I think, a very small part of the whole criminal administration. Thank you. 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 Reminded me a little bit of what happened after the moon landings, and uh, the task was found, uh, instead of dissolving NASA, a, task, a new task was found, like building the space shuttle and dabbling into climate science. 
Was this the fact, was this the case uh, with the army after the civil war? There was a, a war, an army without a task and a state newly in love with power and they found a task. Um, or this is more of a, um, uh, was it just chance that it happened that way? Uh, and the, the related question is the uh, private railroad uh, trans railroad. Uh, uh, how long before all this happened? Uh, have they already established it, or were they in the process of building it at the time? Were, were the others um, competitors who were just lazy and wanted to help from the government? A uh, uh, few more details about that, please. Uh, yeah, I, I uh, do address that in that book chapter that I was summarizing in my talk. That, uh, you know, one of the uh, motivations for what happened to the Plains Indians was exactly that, that the, uh, if, if the war was ending and even some of the you know, most famous uh, American generals were uh, laid off, <laughs> were just sent home. And so, uh, but uh, with a new war, a new possible war against the Indians, it created, uh, you know, career opportunities for the existing army. And so, so of course, the army became a lobbyist for the Indian Wars. Uh, as much as anything, because uh, it meant uh, continued pay uh, and, uh, and all the rest that goes along with it. And so I do mention that in the, in the book chapter that I was talking about, and, uh, and they were definitely a part of it. Uh, and just like any other government bureaucracy, you know, for, uh, or not even government bureaucracies, uh, you know, a lot of nonprofit groups too. Uh, uh, the March of Diamonds was created to uh, cure, help cure polio, and it's still around. You know. As far as that goes, so it's sort of pretty natural. On the, the transcontinentals, the Great Northern Railroad that I mentioned was built in the uh, late 1870s. After it was after the uh, the uh, Civil War, of course, and after the building of the government subsidized railroads. And so, uh, in my other writing, I just make the point that uh, the free market uh, did build the transcontinental railroad. It just did it a few years later. And so uh, the case, uh, you know, there was a, a market failure case was made for the subsidies to the transcontinental railroad saying capital markets would never uh, be sufficient. But James J. Hill proved that they were uh, it was just a few years uh, later. And of course, uh, the ones that were built and were subsidized by government were horribly inefficient. Every, every politician in America wanted a separate rail line to his district in return for his votes. And so uh, the rail line to the west coast looked like a cobweb, <laughs> as opposed to James J. Hill's straight line across the Rocky Mountains. And uh, so that, uh, I guess that answers your question. I have a question for Stephen Sella. Um, worldwide, the uh, government of intellectual property seems to be rolling along with gathering strength, strength as it goes. Um, copyright periods are being extended, penalties are being increased, enforcement agencies are popping up all over the world. Um, is there any good news on the anti-intellectual property front that you can tell us about? Well, I think in libertarian circles there's increasing awareness that is not libertarian. Um, and I think the internet has basically made some types of IP enforcement almost impossible is also good. Um, but yes, it does continue to roll along. I mean, there are some movements among some um, some groups, uh, the software types, people like this, that they, they, they do advocate uh, for reducing protection. But, uh, you know, we have the act coming up. We do have copyright terms and patents getting stronger all the time. So I don't think it's getting very much better right now. Say you were to put your argument to the
is preserved to systems. May and some will, in due course, produce a product which has a commercial application. He would say, we can't really quantify these effects, but our hunch is that the overall impact is that our data is weak on growth. Do you think that's the kind of answer you would give you? I'm yet to meet a minister who could give such an articulate and intelligent answer. <laughs> <laughs> they're trying to say that sort of thing, but let me explain why they would be wrong. It might even be that the more and the better the scientists that are funded by the government, the greater the damage to the economy. Imagine an economy where there is no government funding of science, and all the best scientists are working in the industry really helping the economy grow. And then the government comes along and creates the National Science Foundation, takes all the best, and, and is brilliantly organized, really discriminatory, takes all the best scientists out of industry, puts them in a separate foundation, gives them lots of money to produce lots of papers, which by the way, no one outside the media field will ever read. And the result is to impoverish economic growth by taking the best researchers out of industry. The trouble is that government funding science simply seems only to crowd out private funding. There are these huge philanthropic uh, organizations in the 19th century, Carnegie, Wellcome Trust. They're coming back in again now, but in the case, for example, Warren Buffett, but that's only because of the perception of a shortage of funding. The problem is that there is no evidence that the model that you fund scientists independently of industry and somehow it trickles out to the industry and can be exploited. That model seems to be false. It's actually largely science within industry that's visible. And don't forget, industry, 7% of all industrial research is for pure science. Industry understands it more than pure science because it has subtle tacit implications. So yes, the, sound, the minister was saying that. And because of crowding out and because the model is wrong, because you need the science, it's actually the industry itself, he would actually be wrong. But that's what he would say. Or, or, or she, or she. <laughs> uh, I was just curious if you uh, have you any information on the, the reason why in Germany the uh, Althoff system was so uh, prestigious, which consists precisely in being together uh, only the, uh, uh, the famous uh, scientists and the best scientists together in uh, a national system. Do you, want to, do you want to explain to everyone else what the system is because not everyone understands that? Well, it, it, is, it is exactly the sort of system where uh, the government at one point, at the central, the, when uh, Germany became a central state and the, the need for industrialization asserted <coughs> itself, uh, the state organized under the directorship of Mr. Alto uh, a system where all the best forces in science and research were, as it were, brought together in a single uh, system with specialized uh, research institutes and so on, which was funded uh, by the state and which is often credited to the expansion of German power and influence at the time. Um, do you mean the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute? Hmm? Do you mean the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute? Yes. And then latterly, of course, they were known as the um, Max Max. Max. Let me tell you two very interesting things about Berlin economic growth that they never tell you. In 1815, Germany, in terms of GDP per capita and the level of industrialization, was only 75% of that of Britain's in 1815. A hundred years later, in 1914, after Britain had been less declared for a hundred years, and Germany highly reduced with the Kaiser of the Holmes used all the rest of it for a hundred years. Germany still was only 75% of the level of GDP per capita and only 75% of the level of industrialization of Britain. Total failure to convert. It's just a myth that Germany, Germany in the 19th century had crazy economic growth. The Kaiser very famously said two or three months before the war broke out in 1914 that he had to go to war soon because so many of his potential enemies, such as Russia, were successfully converting on Britain. And Germany was lacking the light. And the other really interesting thing about Germany is many of the great German discoveries were actually not funded by the state. Germans are fed a false history of their own country. The, the motor car 
the whole business of four you know, cylinders and the invention of the motor car owed nothing to the state. Zeppelin, self-funded, Hecule, self-funded. Many of the great German discoveries were absolutely in the market or, or philanthropic. And Germany's fed the false history of one economic success in the 19th century. Actually, one of the reasons there are so many German names in America is that millions and millions and millions of Germans had to leave Germany in the 19th century for simple matters of poverty. Germany did not do well economically relative to the leading countries, and many of those advantages and discoveries were actually made independent of the state. Mm. Okay, let's add one thing. Yeah, in his example of how government funded science diverts engineers from the private sector to the government sector, well, it need not divert engineers at all. That the money that would have been spent on government science could have been spent on anything else. And, and we can't, we don't know what it would be, but it doesn't necessarily we need to be uh, private science as far as that goes. And, and it'll be cause creativity and job creation in other parts of the economy. In other words, uh, opportunity cost, the economic concept of opportunity cost should be uh, considered here. Uh, and it involves more than just uh, an engineer working, not working for NASA, but working for some corporation instead. It's a little more global than that. Um, I have two questions. One is for President uh, Jones. Uh, my question is, I think that it's uh, sort of naive to think of the things that we enter, most of the American Indians, as being these non white people who are prepared to trade for everyone, and, and it all could have been resolved um, very peacefully. I think they had a different idea of property, which created a lot of problems. And they're pretty well documented their violence against the European immigrants in the first place. Now, you could argue that that's reactive, that was then reacting to the presence of the European immigrants imposing themselves on the Indians' land, never mind the Indians to fight each other all the time anyway. So I'm asking if you're, if, if taking to the logical conclusion, what you might be saying is that the Indians never should have gone to the New World. Never should have what? Gone to the New World. No, I didn't say that. And, uh, I didn't say what you said in the first part of your thing when you referred to naive either. That's not what I said in my, in my talk. Uh, so you sort of set up a straw man uh, question there. I think uh, there, there always was some degree of conflict. And there's been a lot of research on books written about this and catalog, uh, the, you know, catalog the whole history of conflict between Indians and European immigrants in America. And uh, the argument that I'm, I'm making is that it uh, escalated exponentially during and after the American Civil War. Uh, but there were a lot, you know, many instances of, uh, of trade and cooperation that, that, I, that I mentioned in, in my talk. I didn't say that the Indians were sort of these naive do-gooders who only wanted to welcome the Europeans to their country and, and sell them corn or anything like that, uh, as you sort of suggested in your question. But. Uh, but I think uh, uh, there, there were many examples of the alternative. I mentioned James J. Hill, who uh, cooperated with Indians, by trading with them for rights away across their land, livestock, and things like that. And, uh, and in Canada, Canada didn't do the same thing that Americans did as far as uh, massacring the Indians to get away from the railroads. So I don't deny that Indians uh, 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 you know, uh, engage in bad behavior. I do find it really uh, ridiculous though that uh, we call the Indians savages when the, our own U.S. Army uh, scalps women and children during, during the Indian Wars. Who's the savage there as far as uh, the type of behavior? There was savagery on both sides. And, uh, and I just made the argument that uh, putting the standing army there was uh, essentially a form of corporate welfare for the railroad corporations. Uh, and I cite the words of General Sherman himself in saying that he considered that to be his new job after the end of the Civil War to make way for the railroads. So, you're being shown up on the railroad. Why not? I'm... <laughs> my, my other question is for Professor Keeler, actually. I was just wondering, what prevented the Wright brothers from licensing their airplanes and, and being able to develop aviation in America that way? That is a very good question. Because the British and the French and the Germans paid the license fees. But because the American government, Glenn Curtis, the Smithsonian, all got together, all the Wright Brothers competitors got together to deny that the Wright Brothers had flown first, to claim that the American Smithsonian had flown first. 
they were constrained from getting licenses from the Wright brothers because that would deny their own claims and they got there first. And so all the Wright brothers' opponents were trapped. They couldn't apply for them, or they felt they couldn't apply for licenses because that would acknowledge the Wright brothers' patents and precedents. So by challenging the Wright brothers' patents, they removed themselves the ability to get the licenses. And so American aviation was simply silent. And the Wright brothers themselves were made miserable with sin because they spent the whole time. They, they stopped flying as well. The skies over America were empty. No one was looking. I have some of a concrete example for Dr. Hoffman. I would like you to talk about the case of uh, federation in Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, I'm a complete amateur on the subject, however I know that when it came to apartments, it was fairly painless. People like my parents basically bought it from the government. Things became more complicated when it came to the issue of land, which um, from what I understand is the last natural resource. So in cases of companies like IKEA, they could own the building, but not the land on it, uh, which causes all kinds of problems. So I'd like you to talk about how that sort of thing should have been resolved. Thank you. I, I do have a, a little chapter in my democracy, the book, uh, God That Fails, where, um, that deals with the question of how to de-social, how to de-socialize previously socialistic countries. Um, in cases like East Germany, for instance, where you had uh, property titles uh, and recordings still in existence, uh, the original ownership is as if you should have been uh, uh, restituted, you should have received their, uh, their property uh, back. Um, in countries like Russia where uh, many records that had been destroyed, that, that would obviously be um, more, dif more difficult um, to do. Um, for, those, for those countries, again, there is no there is no a heuristic theory how, how to do that. That requires something, also some sort of wisdom, but there are some, uh, some, basic, some basic rules. Um, those people who currently work in various factories, and there was no previous owner which could be restored into this position, um, the, the current factory workers sh should become the owners of it, uh, have shares that they can sell. So um, almost this the slogan of, of the communist uh, workers, sh workers should own the factories, the farmers should uh, own the land and so forth, except of course um, it must be a title that, um, that can be um, traded freely uh, in the market to make it possible that this, again, um, a concentration of uh, property in the hands of those that are entrepreneurially um, better uh, and out of the hands of those who simply do not want to bear any risk but uh, remain, um, uh, remain, uh, remain employees. Um, in, in, welfare, in welfare states, the privatization is in a way easier. Um, because they always have to recognize that all, all publicly owned goods have been <coughs> produced with tax funds and there exist tax records, so to speak, that would allow us to say how many did I, how much did I pay in local taxes, how much did I pay in state taxes. How much did I pay in uh, in federal taxes? Um, to the extent that these records can be produced, uh, people would simply acquire uh, a share according to their previous tax payments in these various um, in these various public public goods. So 
restores those who have a valid title uh, to the property. Uh, in those cases where there is no valid title or things get lost in history and we do not know um, who, is, who is the owner, then we use some sort of similar idea as the homesteading idea. The workers working in a factory have indeed, so to speak, homes, homesteaded it uh, and they get an equal, an equal share that can be sold. There's a question for Senator Kinsella. Uh, my mind is very sympathetic to know what I mean, so I stop with all these emails. But uh, how would that look? I suppose there would be no IP laws under a private law, or a private uh, law society. And uh, what is the line of argument for that? That, that, wouldn't, that there would be probably no IP laws. I, I don't understand the question. The under private uh, private law society, private property society, with the uh, competing laws of no monopoly. How would uh, uh, how would that uh, how would that uh, society look concerning IP laws? Oh well, I think that uh, you're describing a society for libertarian principles are widely recognized. That would be the only way to reach a private law society in the first place. And of course, property rights would be strongly protected. And so it would be seen that um, any type of proposal to have an IP right enforced would be just an infringement of property rights that already exist. So, so for example. If, uh, if there's uh, private property rights are widely respected and protected by whatever legal system exists in the private society, uh, if someone tries to uh, sue his neighbor for copying his idea, let's say, uh, what he's asking the courts to do is to force his neighbor to give him some of his property. Well, presumptively, he owns his property in terms of money damages, let's say. Or to give him an injunction or an order telling this guy, you know, you can't use your printing press in a certain way, you can't do it with X, Y, Z. So then the answer to the question, the question is, well, who owns the property? Who owns the money? The defendant, the defendant owns the money. And unless you can justify uh, that basically you've committed a crime or a contract, there's no justification for taking someone's property away. So basically, sanctity of property rights rules out the ability to have uh, property rights and you know, ideas and patterns. In fact, it's, it's basically, a, it undercuts the homesteading rule as the basis of property. It's sort of a new homesteading rule. Instead of saying uh, the first person who uses the property or his assigning the title down the line is the uh, best claimant to this piece of this scarce resource, to make a successful IP claim, you would have to basically come up with a second rule, which is uh, if someone owns a resource, if it can be used in a certain way uh, according to an idea they came up with, so by sitting in your house and coming up with ideas, you start gaining these claims, partial ownership claims to property already homesteaded and owned by other people. This is the very problem that I think. It undercuts uh, the basis for private property rights. I think I just want to um, go back briefly to the question before. One of the issues is you have land and let's say you have somebody who owned, owned the land previously, but in the meantime, a structure has been erected uh, on the land. Um, you cannot physically separate one, one from the other. Um, in, in this situation, um, the old landowner and the new construction, construction owner, so to speak, there is no other possibility but that they have to bargain um, and obviously they have uh, an interest in coming to a quick conclusion in this because after all uh, one cannot really sell anything without, uh, without the other. Um, but there is no other solution but a bargain in, in this case. What, what part of the ownership should go to the landowner, what part of the ownership um, should go the, to the uh, newly, newly erected uh, structure on the land that originally belonged to someone else. But there is no other solution but to bargain. But because they both have an interest so to come to a quick solution, um, I think 
judges, uh, arbitrators in this case, would, up, would come up very quickly with mutually beneficial solutions to the problem. Yes, I would like to uh, challenge uh, some statements or resource questions of state of state about German economic uh, development before the First World War, uh, basically because I found them very strange, having read many, many books on German history this period over the last 40 years. Um, and uh, from what I gather, um, although Germany may not have closed the industrial gap in England, they came very close to doing this by the First World War. During the war, it's industrial output is, is, is later. Uh, which is not surprising. I'm unaware of Kaiser Bill ever making the statement that Russia is going to creep up on us and we have to go to war uh, before they do. He was concerned about the disproportion uh, in, uh, in military, uh, the availability of military men because the draft in France was much, uh, much greater, was more intensive than in Germany. Um, the tax rate in Germany was probably the lowest in Europe. Uh, despite the fact that there were social programs under under Kaiser and something like between five and seven uh, percent. There's a book by Eberhard Schrau on Kaiser II II that came out last year, which deals with economic development in this in this period. Um, unfortunately, it's not been translated into English. Um, there there also is the fact that many of those institutes which supported scientific research came from private sources. They were not, they certainly were not entirely state funded. One can, of course, complain about cartelization in Germany or in the United States in this period, um, but there were private industrial um, benefactors, primarily that gave money to the institutes that were doing scientific research. Uh, in any case, those are, uh, are all the, uh, the critical points that, I, that I'm raising. Yeah, uh, um, thank you for that. Um, it was on the 21st of June 1914 that the Kaiser told the banker Max Farberg that he was contemplating an early war because Germany's economy was falling behind relative to its potential enemies and he was losing his window for victory. And you're absolutely right, by the way, about the growth and the invasive <coughs> and private funding for research in Germany, which is not often talked about as much as it should be. The key is this business of anecdotes. The wonderful thing about Angus Madison's data is it's quantitative, it's not anecdotal. And you simply have to look at the data. And Germany simply failed to converge on Britain. And it didn't even do a particularly good job on nearly converging on Britain. The French did a better job, paradoxically. And I think that the difference between anecdote and Angus Madison's quantitative data is, I find, very interesting. Germany, of course, is a much bigger country. So although it's lower in terms of GDP per capita than Britain, it has a significantly larger population. And so in total, it becomes more far than Britain. But relatively, I think Madison's data is surprisingly interesting and maybe goes against so much of the anecdote. That's what I would say in reply. But we should dis we shouldn't disagree. We should look at the facts we'd like to have in front of us. And Madison could prove you right or me right. I have a lot of facts in front of me. But I'm pretty sure that's what he says. <laughs> We don't, have to, we don't have to argue. We should refer to Madison, who knows more than anyone else. Can we agree to, to, dis, can we agree to disagree on that? Yes. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, I have a question for Mr. Kiel. I'd like to draw a link between your presentation and that of Nikolai Gershaw yesterday regarding economic global prices. So, what can you say about the destruction of economic science by government funding? I very much regret that why I was punished by Hans to go last, but I wasn't here yesterday. Was this the talk on who was speaking about the Nobel Prizes? I read the title and I was so jealous that I couldn't get to the talk, but I can't comment sadly because I didn't get to the talk. So I just said enough about it. But I wish I got to the talk. <laughs> I have no other question. <coughs> Just a commentary on what Professor Kova uh, said about uh, bargaining uh, for peace of socialization. Because this question emerges all the time in Latin American countries regarding feudal, uh, feudal, uh, basic feudal systems uh, in haciendas and you know, in farms in general. Uh, but of course, the same solution uh, Professor Kova has provided applies. 
because any modification that the descendants of the original owners or homesteaders of the land have uh, done, uh, added a sulfural means, have to be subtracted from the modifications that the conquistadores and the, the Republic era um, Latin Americans did. <coughs> Again, it, it's, uh, it's what we use heritage for. We use experts to ascertain the, the, how assets have uh, in value over time and who owns how much of the uh, improvements. Yeah, just I can only uh, briefly remark on this. Um, the principle always has to be that he who currently occupies something, the presumption is, of course, in his favor that he is the owner, unless somebody else can show uh, that he is actually the legitimate owner. It is not sufficient to say the, the current owner um, somehow came into the possession uh, that he has right now due to certain crimes that occurred in the distant past. Uh, that is practically the case for everything that we ever, any piece of land that is owned that was somehow acquired, there was some crime occurred in the course of history. But this does not show that some specific other individual has a claim to it. Um, so only if a specific individual can show I have a better claim uh, to this piece of property than, than the current possessor by showing records and so forth and detailing the crimes that have occurred in the past would we want to restore them. So if the Indians say we want to claim that back, uh, or, the Rome, or the, the Italians want to claim certain territories back, uh, that is not sufficient to establish any valid claim uh, specific individuals must show that they are actually the rightful owner instead of the person who is current is currently there. So this is this is why um, in the, these uh, socialist uh, countries we do face tremendous difficulties because sometimes we simply cannot trace back far enough into the past in order to establish who is the rightful owner, and then we must decide. What do we do with property where no past rightful owner can be established? How do we privatize that? And then I would say those people who currently make use or have made currently use of the property have, of course, a better claim to it than somebody who lives thousand miles away. Of, uh, of the Daniel's um, talk, um, what you actually highlight is the increasingly strong organization of public life because um, we do not like people smoking, it's associated with bad life, so we, we forbid it. But we like our football teams, and therefore we encourage <coughs> our people to uh, practice sport. And this is a phenomenon we see increasingly in England where um, children get prosecuted for having racist comments, where um, we see civil servants digging in your bin bags to see if you recycle properly. Um, and where, even if uh, the government has bankers to make money, we prosecute bankers because we use the of people making that much money. Um, I was wondering if you wanted to comment on that. All I would say is that there's a kind of that kind of moral, not moralization, moralisticization like, uh, in public life is obviously going on. At the same time as there's demoralization of the private life, so that uh, uh, there's this kind of paradox. And of course, as people become more demoralized, so so social pathology increases, which gives public authorities more and more. Uh, superficially more and more reason to interfere. And so they're constantly, the, our, our public authorities are constantly chasing the, the, the consequences of the bad behavior of, of our people. 
Um, but I don't really have anything else to say. Of course, one of the one of the things another disaster in Britain has been that we have to employ large numbers of people in public administration because we insist on sending so many people to university and they can't really do anything else. And one way to employ them is to interfere in other people's lives. <laughs> Um, this is a little bit of a follow-up question, really. Um, Tom and perhaps some of the other trainers have comment regarding European settlement in the new world. I believe it's a German. Do you think, you know, for example, if we take the case of Manhattan, where that island was born from presumably the German moments, and that then the Manhattan was is uh, legitimately European in the sense that um, the European settlers uh, bought the land from the original owners, and then and, but they necessarily mean the Midwest is then illegitimately in, in European hands because it wasn't war, it was conflict. And if, and if I could just uh, think about the, the conflict in the Middle East that, that we witnessed with Israel, was that, were the origins of Israel legitimate in the sense of the, there were wealthy Jewish charities buying land, the Rothschilds, for example, buying land in Israel uh, from, from the Ottoman bank holders? Does that make a the, the the nucleus of Israel was legitimate to make the, the expansion of Israel be legitimate. How, how do we how do we grasp these um, how do we grasp these topics and what what how do we decide what's legitimate be legitimate given given our principles on, on legitimate legitimacy of ownership? Well my talk had nothing to do with Israel so I don't, I'm not sure what any of your questions had to do with what I actually said in my talk. It wasn't a general discussion of land ownership throughout the world. Uh, the point I was making was uh, the U.S. government has false virtue uh, in, in, in claiming that what it did during and after the Civil War years was so exceptionally virtuous that it gives it a so essentially a carte blanche to uh, rule the world, uh, essentially. And this was just one, one chapter of this book that I, that I was describing. And so I, I, and I didn't lay out the philosophical or legalistic case for land ownership in it. I was just trying to describe uh, the history of what, what happened. I didn't make any moral or ethical judgment on who should have owned the land and who shouldn't. I was just, I'm just describing what happened as far as that goes. So I'm not sure how useful it would be for me to just speculate on, on, on these kind of questions. Uh, I wouldn't say uh, the Europeans uh, should not have owned the Midwest because you know there were, there were some of the land was, was acquired uh, by purchase. I mentioned that the uh, by the 20th century, they had spent uh, more than $800 million on purchasing land, and so, and that including what is some of the, mid the Midwest. So it wasn't all uh, through conquest, as far as that goes. Yeah, I mean, again, that is different from case from case to case, um, and it depends very very much on what time lag is involved. Um, who of the Indians, even if they were harmed, the, the, some land was stolen, some land was acquired. Um, in any case, who can prove now that they have a better title to the land than those who sit on the land? The closer these events are to the present, the easier it is to figure these disputes out. Um, in the case of Israel, I'm sure there are many uh, many Palestinians who can show clear-cut titles to land that was taken away from them. Um, uh, if you go back 100 years, 200 years, it is almost impossible that you can just uh, show the necessary uh, documents that establish you instead of somebody else as the owner. If I can just make a small point. The lady back there, was as a follow-up question to her, so like, should we, the English, ever have gone to North America? And all I can say is I wrote a piece in Times Higher three years ago, in which I pointed out that the original English in, in the Mayflower people who landed in Massachusetts, and at the same time the English landed in Virginia, and they each landed on land owned by a tribe. And what is extraordinary 
Within nine months of arriving, both sets of English colonists engaged in a genocidal war against that very tribe. And what is also extraordinary is they write back to their sponsors back in England, full of pride in having killed the enemy. And they determined that they were raping and murdering with months of arriving on the North American continent. And their sponsors back in England were shocked at the speed with which they had gone native and savage. It's the most extraordinary thing. So, if you just look at my name, Times Higher, America, American Savagery. And um, it is the most extraordinary. The moment we arrived in England, we went from being nice English people to horrible Americans and all the horrible you described. <laughs> There's a tendency amongst the English press to say that parents that don't monogamy their children should be prosecuted and should have their children taken away from them because they think it's almost criminal and neglect not to vaccinate your child. And I was thinking, uh, do you think that maybe it would take this even further to say that any parent that smokes in the house of a child because there's a proven mark, do you think that the press would take it even further into saying that that should constitute neglect and parents that smoke in front of their kids? Especially since there's evidence that says that parents that smoke have children that are more likely to smoke themselves. Do you think that maybe that should constitute abuse under the current system because they're pushing the boundaries of what constitutes abuse more and more and trying to step into the family and take control over what should be the role of the parent? I, I think that's a distinct possibility. And of course, since there's no end to the number of things that can be shown to do good or harm, uh, there's no end to the potential interference. It is already the case, I believe, that you, it's very difficult for parents who smoke to adopt a child. I think that smoking is one of the few things that will preclude anyone from being able to adopt. Um, but of course, one of the things about uh, uh, this is that it will always be applied inconsistently according to a preconceived moral conception. Um, so, uh, yeah, I can well see a time when uh, there will be smoke alarms in people's homes and uh, social workers will come and rush in and protect <laughs> children from, uh, from uh, smoke, uh, the smoke from the parents. I think it's well within the bounds of possibility. The other thing I must say is that uh, uh, my experience is that satire is prophecy. <laughs> So that if you think of a satirical idea within about 10 years, it's actually become a reality. I have a question for Professor Holder, again on the question of topic of your institution. Um, years ago, um, Diane Cole published a paper about the Pakistan and the uh, institution regarding also social discomforts. And this argument uh, was as follows. Um, I want to restrict the restitution uh, to the generation which uh, suffered it mm -hmm. because giving it, uh, uh, accepting the restitution for the next generation uh, is not, uh, they didn't uh, suffer it as a loss, but they received it as a windfall of profit for themselves. So I don't think that uh, there is anybody here in this room who would uh, uh, support this argument because this I find it possible. But uh, is there, um, I, I think we should, we should concretize a little bit this question of time lag. Is it the time lag as such which limits uh, uh, the restitution, or is it the time lag only in the sense that it makes it much more difficult to define uh, the property rights of, uh, of, of the, of the uh, family, of the restitution? Uh, there was a, uh, an, an interesting case, and it's our case, maybe if you want, uh, in the 19th century when a member of the Wallenstein family complained, uh, went to court, and they uh, claimed the restitution of the property of uh, the historic Wallenstein, whose, whose property was confiscated um, because of the conspiracy emperor. And they had all the papers because uh, this was the family was in process of all the papers that did not succeed in this. On the other hand, we have uh, cases of restitution 
this time spans of more than 300 years for political decisions, for instance, the French Revolution, which restituted the uh, property of, of Indonesians for uh, obvious political reasons. So I would, uh, would like to, to, to give you an assessment of this uh, time lag problem regarding uh, the Revolution. So you. it's not, it is not the, the time lag as, uh, as such, it is just the, the time lag makes a makes it practically more complicated. Otherwise, the whole thing would be an attack on, inher on inheritance rights. Um, since I think that it can be justified quite well, that, that is this the right of inheritance. Um, if, if we would be able to establish a clear-cut trace that goes back 300 years, I would not be opposed to restoring the original owners uh, even though these are the descendants of descendants of descendants. Um, so, uh, time makes the problem more complicated as a technical, practical affair, but in, in principle, of course, uh, it, it is unimportant. Un unless, unless somebody takes the right in inheritance is injustice. Um, which I think is a ridiculous position to take, but again, then people would have to take that position. I'm against uh, the right uh, of inheritance. I should mention that also uh, there exist also some famous libertarians, or people who call themselves libertarian, uh, who think there should be no right of inheritance. So the James Buchanan, for instance, is a typical case. Uh, and so is uh, also Patrick Buchanan has also uh, come out and, against the right of inheritance. In Patrick Buchanan's case, he has no children. That makes sense. As think in James Buchanan's case, he has also no children. Right. It also makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> two more questions. I think we'll close the list now. It's five or six. Uh, right. um, open question to the panel. Uh, the past three days, We've heard sort of uh, State of the Union of uh, different areas about the way in which the state intervenes in people's lives. We heard about in banking, the issuance of credit, controlling currencies. Uh, the Swiss Central Bank being able to punch their currency 20% in a matter of days. Uh, uh, Warfare, clear back in the time Tom was talking about, actually took a lot of men and a lot of bullets in the capital. Now you can fly better a drone and wipe out the village. Uh, in a very uh, uh, efficient and bad way, sense of the word, um, in health, uh, uh, invasion, the ability to control people's lives through technology, cameras, I was driving on the highway and noticed they don't bother pulling people over in large part to issue tickets in the states in some areas now, there's just a camera that auto clocks your speed, auto photographs you in the front seat to prove it was you driving the car and your license plate, and you get a ticket in the mail, no, no, no human capital required. Um, so I wanted to hear your speculations on where does this lead? You know, I mean, uh, people who are like-minded in this room who track the, the rise in uh, states' uh, destructive abilities and power and the way that technology can be harnessed for bad purposes. Uh, where does it end and, and what do you think the, uh, uh, the, the trend is? <laughs> um, well, my view is uh, the state only exists because it is seen as legitimate by most people. So I think um, uh, over time, we're more prosperous. People, I mean, like when, when I always give the example of when Russia, when the Soviet Union collapsed, it was a learning experience. Before that happened, most people you know, really had no idea about communism, whether it was good or bad, except the people suffering. But now there's sort of widespread knowledge among, say, your average American that communism doesn't work with a learning experience. Right? Not, not just the intellectuals or the free market leaders know that. So my only hope is that over time, as we uh, continue to have more prosperity, despite the state, the decrease in technology, uh, that people will just sort of gradually become more economically literate. And have more money to, to engage in. So I, I think economic literacy is the only hope for humanity. Um, and you know, 
know, it's being spread. There are many more free market thinkers in Austria and Austria than libertarians now than 20 years ago, 40 years ago. So I think there's some hope, but I don't think it's going to be quick. Um, so I would just say, I think the, the solution is to laugh at the state, to deny them legitimacy, <laughs> make fun of the government, uh, treat them as clowns and buffoons, and label them for them. I actually am um, looking for somebody who is a comedian uh, that could be invited for something like this. I think we would have plenty of talent around her who could act as ghost writers for these comedians. So if you have some suggestion who might be a potential candidate for this sort of stuff, I would be very happy because this is exactly what I think only if people large masses simply treat these people as jokes. Um, only then will we succeed in delegitimizing them. Unfortunately, we tend to be all too serious, scholarly types, <laughs> and are not all that successful. Um, <laughs> okay. Excluded. Tommy Lorenzo excluded. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's, uh, I agree completely about the uh, uh, making fun of mocking these people, not just them, but the media lab dogs, too, who, who are talking about power. Uh, we had a, a bit of a controversy in the U.S. Uh, several weeks ago when Ron Paul's son ran up in the Senate, and he mentioned that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 did some damage to uh, uh, property rights. And the media went berserk over it. And uh, there's a woman named Rachel Maddow who's on television as her own news show. And I, wrote, I blogged about her, sort of a Dear Rachel letter on the LittleRockBub.com blog. And I said, I understand you've got your panties in a box over there. And I got mean, all this hate mail from conservatives saying, I shouldn't say things like that. But I adamantly disagree. I think we need to mock and ridicule these people. And, and, and I, was, I, I think you know, people will read this and they get a good chuckle. And next time they see Rachel Maddow on TV, they'll think of the panties in the mouth. They, I wonder what's, you know, what's under there. So, and so, so that's, that's the reason I do things like this. I think it's important. It's not just being yeah, fun, you know, being silly. I think it's, we should seriously use more comedy. And the American case of what's going on is a little, uh, it's pretty kind of interesting because of the, the constitutionalism of it. Well, the Constitution no longer, for many years, has, has any restraint at all on the government. The Republicans use the Constitution to try to stop what the Democrats are doing once in a while, and the Democrats use the Constitution to try to stop what the Republicans are doing. But neither party believes in using the Constitution to live in government. And at least when Bill Clinton was president, he was at least worried about the effects of high ta higher taxes on the bond market. There's a famous example where he wanted to raise taxes for socialized medicine, and his Treasury Secretary said, oh, this would be devastating to the bond market. And then Clinton famously you know, uh, used a lot of cuss words and decided not to, raise, not to raise taxes. But now, uh, with Obama, uh, not anything goes. He the help the bond market. He doesn't, he doesn't care about it. They, you know, a trillion dollar a year deficit. So there are no restraints whatsoever. But what is that has led to is that actually all kind of talk and serious talk about secession and nullification uh, there are something like 40 states, maybe more than that now, that have issued, at least issued resolutions saying that they intend to nullify laws that they think are, are uh, unconstitutional, like the, the uh, socialized health care law that Obama had just passed. Nothing may come of it, but uh, Americans are at least waking up to their own history of how they used to do this. They used to nullify laws that uh, were, they thought were not constitutional themselves. They didn't wait for the Supreme Court. I mean, isn't it a farce that we have a system of where the government uh, sets the limits on its own powers through the Supreme Court? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and of course, they, uh, they, they did not rule a single law to be unconstitutional in the U.S. from 1937 to 1995. Everything was just peachy keen according to the Supreme Court. But that, that seems to be turning around. And our friend Tom Woods has a book coming out on nullification at the end of this month. And uh, it'll probably be a big seller. And uh, as, as our friend Gary North says, you can't fight City Hall, but you can pee on the steps and run away. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's what we're doing. <laughs>